Fine. We would like to welcome Dr. Hiba Baroud. She is an associate professor and associate chair in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Vanderburg University. Professor Baroud holds appointments in the computer science and earth and environment science as well. Her research is at the intersection of data analytics, uh, risk, and resilience modeling. Her group develops and applies methods founded in statistical learning, network models, and decision analysis to evaluate infrastructure performance during disasters. She's particularly interested in certainty and uncertainty mostly, and dynamics interdependencies across multiple and um, systems such as infrastructure, humans, and environments. She is the co-chair of the Risk and Resilience Measurements Committee of the Infrastructure Resilience Division at the American Society of Civil Engineers. She serves on the editorial board of the ASCII Journal of the Infrastructure Systems, and she is an associate editor for the Natural Hazards Review for that journal. Uh, she is the recipient of the 2019 Global Voices Fellows, the 2000 20 National Science Foundation Early Career Awards and the 2022 National Academy of Science Arab American Frontiers Fellows. In 2023, she was selected to be a member of the Global Young Academic, uh, 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 Academic and we're very proud to have her here with us. So today, she's going to be um, sharing with us her experience and her research. So please help me welcome Dr. Baroud to our podium. Thank you so much for the nice introduction and thank you Lama, Victor and Sarah for the invitation and for being amazing hosts. I'm really happy to be here. Um, uh, looking at the uh, agenda, uh, there we go. Good. <laughs> looking at the uh, uh, agenda, um, it sort of provides a natural, sorry, is there a problem? Okay, third time. <laughs> so when we're looking at the agenda for today's event, uh, it provides a natural uh, motivation for the talk. Uh, uh, it's evidence that crisis management uh, has multiple dimensions and that requires uh, multiple uh, diverse disciplines to come together and address these uh, dimensions. And this is also due to the fact that uh, the world that we live in is uh, quite complex. If we think of cities as complex systems, we have uh, infrastructure that such as power, transportation, and water systems. We have the natural environment, and we have people. And all these are heterogeneous systems that are highly interconnected, that are also at the same time constantly adapting to change. Some of these changes happen at a uh, slower rate um, and uh, uh, create um, uh, chronic stresses over time, over long periods of time, in the form of a long-term risk. Uh, these include uh, climate change and urbanization. Uh, President Khoury is not here. I hope he doesn't mind me using the word climate change in this context. Um, the other thing is that these cities are also expected to respond to and recover from acute shocks, uh, such as disasters. And these could be, for example, floods. There could be earthquakes and hurricanes. And these events, especially the ones that are driven by natural hazards, are becoming more significant and more frequent as a result of the uh, chronic stresses that I mentioned in the earlier uh, slide. Thankfully, data science is here to save the day. Um, this is a field that is rich uh, with diverse tools that help us um, draw insights from very messy data to inform decisions uh, in the context of disaster resilience, which includes both uh, mitigation, planning, preparedness, as well as responding and recovering from disasters that have already happened. A great example of the latter is actually what happened in the aftermath of the explosion here in Beirut. Multiple organizations came together, collaborated to collect data from various sources, uh, such as remote sensing and, and survey data, uh, to be able to map the uh, recovery progress of the damaged building in the area. 
And this provided valuable information for disaster aid organizations to identify where the need was and be able to allocate uh, resources more effectively. Data science is also helpful in the case of disaster preparedness, specifically in its ability to predict potential disaster outcomes and be able to inform planning strategies or preparedness and mitigation strategies. Um, so an example of that is work that we did with the Houston Food Bank, um, uh, uh, helping them uh, plan and be able to maintain food distribution uh, during disasters in the, in the Houston area. Uh, a lot of their challenges actually are quite similar to WFP and Priya's talk that, re that are related to donors and supply chains. But when we did a stakeholder workshop with them to identify their, pinpo their pain points, uh, it was very interesting that one of the uh, challenges that they had was related to the fact that they don't have knowledge of the, or they would like to have knowledge of the infrastructure failures ahead of time. So for example, where our roads are going to be closed is going to impact the route options that they're going to choose when they're delivering food. Or for instance, if there are areas that are going to have a high risk of power outages, this is going to affect, uh, impact the choice of the food that they're going to deliver, deliver that, might be, uh, that might require cooking or requires uh, refrigerators. So what we did is we um, evaluated risk uh, for the specific case, I'll talk about the power outage specifically. It was quantified as a normalized measure of the maximum number of uh, customers that don't have power. So this is a map of Harris County. This is in Texas, and that's where Houston is. And so the lighter colors refer to uh, higher risk in this case. This map was produced using predictive models based on historical uh, disasters and outage data combined with environmental conditions that might drive or impact the likelihood of an outage. Then we expanded our data set and include, in addition to the static environment, we included dynamic weather uh, forecasts as well as demographic information. And our goal was not only to predict the risk of power outages, but also identify risk factors that might influence the occurrence of these uh, events. Having the dynamic weather variables, uh, it allowed us to go from the static map that was general for any kind of event to a more uh, dynamic map that is updated based on weather forecast. So if we have a hurricane that we know is approaching, these maps get updated every few hours uh, based on information of these dynamic uh, weather forecasts. And this in turn will have the food bank also update their decisions and their operations for food distribution. Now there's a big challenge with using dynamic weather variables is that they are very uncertain. Typically, the forecast of hurricanes is in the form of a probable path. But even with that probable path, we might have hazardous conditions that lie outside of that path. That's one challenge. The second challenge is that because of climate change, these events are becoming more significant. So what we would like to be able to do is we want to predict future events that have not necessarily happened in the past. Basically, we want to be like this house. This picture was taken after Hurricane Ike in 2008. The house was built uh, in 2005 after Hurricane Rita. So it was built up to higher standards based on projections of future events as opposed to events that were experienced, like the rest of the community around that area. But the challenge with machine learning or statistical learning methods, uh, or the traditional ones, is that they rely a lot on historical data and they produce projections or predictions based on the average of these historical data. And what we want is we want the model to actually extend beyond that data and be able to provide uh, a, a, a prediction of the future events that have not necessarily happened in the past. So how do we do this? Uh, one way to this approach is actually to take machine learning models that we're currently using, which in this case we were using ensembles of decision trees, and combine it with Bayes' theorem, which produces a class of uh, 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 statistical models called Bayesian learning. These class of models allow us to account for the uncertainty in the input variables, and they provide, instead of a point estimate, a probabilistic prediction. So we have a whole distribution of all possible outcome that could occur, and because it's a distribution, it allows us to account for these very extreme cases that we have not seen in the past. 
So as a result, when we're looking at risk prediction, if we want to look at, for example, the outage duration, instead of looking at a point estimate, such as we had in the heat map earlier, we actually have a whole range of possible duration for that power outage for each possible event. Now, to be able to improve the accuracy of the model and learn more about these risk factors, we actually added more data to this data set. Instead of look, only looking at Harris County, we looked at all the counties in the U.S. that had, has had, have had um, hurricane-induced power outages over several years. So this provided a richer data set, and it allows us to actually explore these risk factors using uh, the variable importance uh, uh, measure for these variables. So this is based on the proportion of times a variable was selected over all the possible outcomes of the uh, model. <clears throat> uh, as we anticipated, the dynamic weather variables were the most important one. Um, but interestingly, these risk factors also includes some of the other uh, variables that we had in the data, specifically social variables. Which means that disasters are not only a function of infrastructure performance and hazard intensity, there's, there are other factors that turn a natural hazard into a disaster, and those are mainly related to our vulnerability as a community. But the question is, well, how can we consider this additional layer in the data, and how can we consider their interaction, especially that in our knowledge space, we focus a lot, we highly specialize and focus a lot on individual systems, and we know less about their uh, interaction. So the way to be able to um, understand uh, the impact or the importance uh, of these uh, interaction, the only way is to actually look at uh, a case scenario where we have the human system, the infrastructure, and the environmental system all interacting within the context of both short-term and long-term risk. It's only under these conditions that we can actually explore these uh, different dynamics and these interactions. And a great example of that is actually in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has one of the world's most dynamic delta systems. There are three rivers that are uh, uh, merging and draining in the Bay of Bengal, which leads to a, a whole suite of natural hazards in that area. There's the short-term risk of flooding and cyclones, and then there's the long-term risk of sediment transport and uh, erosion and deposition, which means that in some areas we have uh, 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 a lot of people that are struggling with different kinds of disasters or different kinds of hazards throughout the year. As a result, human migration is very active in that area. It's a very densely populated area, and every year, more than a million people actually lose their homes to these hazards, to these floods and uh, cyclones. So we've got the hazards, the human, and then we have a critical infrastructure in that area, which is a very dense inland waterway uh, network. It's the backbone of the country's economy, and it also provides transportation uh, for about a quarter of the people in some areas in the in that inland waterway network, the only way to go from point A to point B is actually using waterways. There are no other modes of transportation. So we are in a situation where we have basically too much water and too little water at the same time. We have, during the times of the year, we have a lot of floods and cyclones that are driving people away from their homes. But at the same time, the sediment transport is actually forming land. And in some areas of that uh, inland waterway network, some of these channels are closing. And they're drying up. And it's, it's making it difficult for boats to be able to pass through and travel. What happens in that case? What you see in this photo here. It means that the, channel, the bigger channels become overcrowded because we have more uh, boats that are routing to the bigger channels. And we have a situation where we have big barges, sometimes carrying coal and oil, next to the small kayak of people that are basically using it to commute. And they've had severe incidents where there was an oil spill and had led to significant losses and human impact. And so um, our goal was originally to be able to anticipate these changes. Can we actually anticipate these changes and inform risk mitigation. So for example, can we dredge some of the areas to, to open up uh, uh, these networks, that these links that are closing, and allow for a uh, better flow of the network? 
And can we anticipate the reconfiguration of that network when these, challenges, when these channels are closing in? The big challenge here is that there was no data to begin with. Um, there's no network, there's no information on the flow. And so what we did is actually we uh, collaborated with colleagues from the University of Texas at Austin, they're hydrologists, but they had developed an algorithm that will detect bodies of water from satellite images. For our purposes, it was the rivers, it was the channels in that network. So we used to process that information, we combined it with reports, with historical maps, and that produced the first ever digital map of the inland waterway network in this uh, delta. Using that network, we analyzed it with uh, network uh, analysis to identify the most critical uh, channels. The most critical channels are the most vulnerable ones, as well as the ones that uh, are important to the connectivity of the rest of the network. And it turned out that these channels correspond to uh, segments that have the highest uh, flow of people and commodities, which was in a way anticipated and also conforming with uh, reports with existing studies by, done by the World Bank. But in reality, the areas that have the highest rate of change are actually the smaller channels that are in a highly dynamic part of the delta where these uh, uh, lands are forming. And what happens is that the loss of connectivity in these other areas happens at a much slower time. We don't really notice it. But over a long period of time, it accumulates and starts to impact the connectivity in the rest of the network. In addition to that, these areas uh, are where people have actually converted these infilled channels to land that became their home. It be they've actually used it for our shrimp farming and agriculture. So uh, this complicates further the decision of identifying areas that need mitigation uh, measurements, such as, for example, uh, dredging, um, because in this case, what we're doing is to fix the infrastructure problem that was caused by the natural hazard means that people are going to lose their livelihood and their home. And these are the people that have actually moved away uh, from their homes in the first place because of the natural hazard. So it becomes this convoluted, very complex decision that a simple network analysis or vulnerability assessment cannot actually capture this complexity across different layers of the system. I promise there's a higher, uh, the, the talk will end on a higher note. I know I've been talking about challenges and problems. <laughs> so we talked about the challenge to, uh, of hazards intensity. Uh, we talked about how to address the lack of data, uh, and how to uh, be able to capture the impact on the community from uh, our models. The question is, can we actually put them all together? And if we do, does it help? The quick answer is yes, and yes, it does, since we are short on time. So when we add data, uncertainty, and humans, um, the way to think about it, this is an example that we did in another county in the US, Shelby County, this is in Tennessee, where we combined power outages, so uh, the power grid, the water system, and we overlaid it on a heat map of the social vulnerability index. What is that index? It's a combination of indicators uh, that measure the vulnerability of people. It could be the socioeconomic status, it could be um, the level of education, it could be uh, the percent of elderly in that area, so darker color refer to higher vulnerability. And instead of thinking about infrastructure systems as these built environment that are fixed, we actually relax that assumption and we consider them to be, uh, their connections to be fluid, meaning that when changes happen in the social systems, they interact with the infrastructure systems and that uh, leads to uh, a pr potential uncertainty in how these infrastructure systems are uh, interconnected. When we do this, uh, we uh, are able to actually combine multiple modeling approaches. Primarily here we combine statistical learning and network analysis to be able to anticipate 
where the cascading effects are going to happen, where the failures are going to cascade through these uh, multiple systems. The scenario here uh, in this area, the challenge was a, an earthquake scenario. So we're concerned about widespread damages. So we have multiple infrastructure systems or assets that will fail at the same time. And so these models will allow us to predict or anticipate uh, uh, these failures ahead of time. And the advantage of combining all these uh, uh, components together is that we can inform what we refer to as a dynamic recovery process, meaning that as the disaster is evolving, I can reprioritize my infrastructure assets based on information of the hazard and uncertainty as well as the changes in the social systems. And we compare this to a static recovery process, which is represented here by the uh, black curve. So the blue curve is the dynamic and the black curve is the static. The static is the typical asset risk assessment process where you do a vulnerability assessment, define your top priority assets, and inform the recovery based on that. So for example, a utility company might prioritize the recovery of power outages based on the number of customers that don't have power. They start with the largest group that doesn't have power and they fix those first. As opposed to potentially actually prioritizing maybe a retirement home where they rely on respiratory machines for uh, the power. And so this dynamic process is updating these linkages over time and it's also incorporating the social vulnerability information as it's going uh, through the disaster. And as a result of that, the resilience of the infrastructure system is improved. It's actually recovered in 60% less uh, restoration time. So when we're considering the social vulnerability and these interactions, the infrastructure actually benefits itself by recovering much faster following the disasters. Some key takeaway messages. Um, you know, we've seen examples in this talk on how data science has brought together different disciplines, uh, but I also want to highlight the fact that the more we collaborate across disciplines, the stronger the impact of data science is going to have on disaster resilience. Um, there are ways to uh, explore different models and bring them together to solve these challenges. One thing to keep in mind is the trade-off between interpretability and the flexibility. We can get very creative, have flexible models, address uncertainty and so on, but if these models are going to be uh, to end up uh, uh, with the user that they're going to actually implement, so for example, in the Houston Food Bank, that was a big consideration for us because we were handing off basically a predictive model and we wanted to have the least uh, 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 demand for human intervention in addressing uh, any uh, issues with the model. In terms of data, uh, we've seen examples about how to uh, uh, bring together or integrate multiple data sets from various sources. With the Bangladesh example, uh, we had a student on the project who ended up actually looking at social data. So there were surveys that were administered in that part of the uh, delta that looked at the reason why people are migrating. And so she used machine learning models to be able to predict the reason and where people are going to migrate to next. And in another uh, work, she actually branched out and considered even qualitative data. So she went and interviewed people to bring in a personal perspective to the migration and created a story map of that. So this, uh, again, you can get creative in terms of the type of the data that you get. And in some cases, you know, quantitative data has a limit, such as in this case where you can explore and consider qualitative or more personal uh, data. Wanted to uh, acknowledge the support of the National Science Foundation uh, for supporting the work that I presented in this uh, presentation. And uh, thank you for uh, listening, and I want to thank the collaborators as well. Thank you, Dr. Barwood. Uh, for the sake of time, we have, uh, you know, the time for one uh, question, quick one. Uh, yeah, just to, I wanted just to acknowledge, I mean, very moving picture, so I really encourage the audience to share on hashtag with 2023, the images that you've taken, I think you really showed amazing, unfortunate, you know, uh, uh, pictures about disaster. So please tweet and retweet so that, you know, we are connected to our, our online uh, audience, which, by the way, we uh, encourage them to contribute their questions. We'll be addressing them as we go throughout the days. So we have a question yeah. here. Thank you very much for this great presentation, really. 
And I'm interested in this space and, uh, you know, the BART system. Yeah. And how does it uh, interface with uh, maybe scenario programming models? Like, uh, does it provide you with possibilities of uh, possibilities in the future? And how do you move from uh, being a little bit uh, predictive and maybe deterministic to something that is open to new and dynamic data that comes in? And the second, this brings a question about the value of historical data and how much of it becomes relevant as you are in the midst of a, of a problem, you know, uh, as you, as you uh, mentioned. Thank you. Is it clear? Yeah, those are excellent questions. I'm writing down since it's two, and I'm going to likely forget the first one. So <laughs> I do want to actually, before I answer a uh, uh, disclaimer, I did not take the photos. I, I aspire to be a photographer, but I was not the photographer on, on this trip. Um, so to answer your first question about BART, um, so this is the way the model is structured, the Bayesian statistic, the way they are structured is to actually address the very uh, uh, scenario that you mentioned is that moving away from only relying on historical data and considering options that are outside of that historical data. And the way it works is it's kind of like a balance. And this will answer your second question about historical data. So there's some sort of a balance. There's the historical data. But then with uh, Bayesian statistics, there's what we call the prior information. So it's either a decision maker, I come in with some prior knowledge, um, or it could be, it, it works as a cycle. So I have this prior knowledge, I bring in the data, I update my prior knowledge, and I, now I have a posterior distribution. And then if I have more data coming in, then this posterior distribution becomes the prior, add more data, and then update it. So this allows the model to actually learn and update and branch out from just looking at uh, the historical uh, data in this case. Now, the way, you know, how much, depending on how much data you have and depending on how strong your uh, priors are, this is where the balance comes in and you'll be able to see uh, which of these two parts of the equation is actually contributing to the final prediction. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Thank you for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, so I have a question uh, regarding uh, earthquakes. You know that an earthquake like, uh, could be considered uh, one of the uh, deadliest uh, natural disasters. And after what happened in Turkey uh, recently, uh, it became um, like a concern for, uh, for many. So how would uh, AI or uh, data science um, address, how would address actually this issue? As you know that earthquakes are unpredictable. Is there any, um, uh, um, or are there any advances um, uh, in, this, uh, in this field to predict uh, earthquakes? Thank you. That's a great question and um, it would be nice if we can predict earthquakes the way we predict hurricanes, right? We know a few days beforehand and we have these uh, uh, forecast models. Uh, I think with earthquake, because there, there's a challenge to predict when uh, it will happen and how it will happen, uh, the uh, uh, AI technology and the science is focusing more on the response side of resilience. So how can we uh, design buildings or use material that will be able to respond to these uh, earthquakes? There's uh, a really uh, state-of-the-art technology with materials looking at self-healing concrete, for example, is that the concrete will be damaged as a result of the earthquake, but then it will uh, heal on its own and the building will be able to continue to be habitable throughout the uh, earthquake. So it's generally the focus is more on the response, uh, being able to, for example, inform evacuation strategies or uh, design and build uh, buildings that will be able to withstand uh, the event as well as aftershocks. <laughs> 